We will complete this series I started uh, a week ago, whenever that was, <laughs> about resisting the devil. And the title tonight is Be the Remnant. Now, first thing we should do, go to Psalm 118, the 118th Psalm. And we're going to make sure that we know what a remnant is, if we're supposed to be one. So the 118th Psalm in verse 22 and 23 is actually talking about Jesus, but it's talking about us in Him. And this is, I think, even though the word remnant doesn't occur here, I think this is a really good definition of what we mean when we're talking about remnant. It says in the 118th Psalm, verse 22, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Of course, that's Jesus. In many places in the New Testament, it quotes this verse here, and it says, This is from the Lord, and it's His doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Um, this is what, how the Lord does things, and it's not the way people would do things. Just like Jesus would not have been the way that the Jews would have thought that their Messiah was going to be. And we'll talk a little bit about how those kinds of misconceptions occur with people about how we think God ought to do something or other, and he does it quite differently. And this business about being a remnant is one of those things. Now, also, to define remnant for you, I want to show you this. It's an old sock, right? Okay. Now, this is a remnant because it's the only one of a pair. The other one got thrown away because I guess I got a hole in the heel or something. It wasn't usable as a sock anymore. But I hung on to it, and I'm glad I did because when it gets down below freezing or down to zero degrees like we've had here the last couple of years, what I do with this as I go wrap this around my water hydrant that's on the front of my house, and it protects the pipe. So this, that could have got thrown away, did a very useful function at my house. Okay, and that's the idea of a remnant. When God saves something, even if it doesn't appear to be, you know, very pretty or very useful. I mean, I wouldn't wear this thing. <laughs> but I sure wouldn't hesitate to wrap it around my pipe if it's zero degrees outside, right? Okay, that's a remnant. Now go to Romans chapter 9. So for us to identify as God's remnant does not require that we be pretty or attractive or... Uh, powerful or anything in the world's eyes. Because, you know, it said there that Jesus was rejected by the builders. Well, who are the builders? Well, they are the global elite. They are the shakers and movers. They are the oligarchs. They are the, the power uh, brokers of the world. And they rejected him. So if we get rejected by the world... Uh, hey, that goes with the territory. But that doesn't mean God rejects us. See, okay. Um, Romans 9, verse 27. Isaiah calls out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, in other words, very numerous, it's only the remnant that will be saved. And in the brackets it said, we'll be saved from God's judgment. I, I think that's how we should look at this business of being a remnant. Just like the, um, the sock going around my hydrant, uh, it, I, I don't leave it out there all year long. 
I only do it when it's critical, when, when there's destructive weather, when something bad would happen to my pipes. That's when I put that out there. So a remnant is preserved for a time of crisis, right? So he's saying here that the, only the remnant is going to be saved, and that doesn't mean, you know, eternally uh, damned or, or going to heaven or whatnot. It means uh, going to be surviving in the time of judgment. Verse 28, For the Lord will execute His word upon the earth. He will conclude his dealings with mankind completely and without delay. Well, see, that's what he's going to do before Jesus comes back. It is as Isaiah foretold. If the Lord of hosts had not left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah, totally rejected and destroyed. So God intends to save us, and he'd like to save everybody. I mean, he's not willing that any should perish. But the, the reality of the situation is not every Christian, even, is going to be the remnant. And that doesn't mean they're going to hell. But it does mean that being the remnant is a very small... It says here in brackets in my, my Bible in verse 27, a small believing minority. Well, all Christians are believers in Jesus. Well, okay, but we're not just talking about simple salvation here. We're talking about believing to survive and thrive and be useful and have the power of God operating in our lives. Okay, that's what we mean when we talk about a believing minority. Uh, keep the place here in Romans and go to Revelation chapter 12. And we're going to be spending a lot of time here in Revelation. And I know we go over these things a lot. But since we're also talking about not just about end times and about judgment but about Satan, we need to see what's heading up in our time. And of course it's here. Revelation 12, verse 1. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon beneath her feet and on her head a crown of twelve stars. There are celestial astronomical uh, things that actually uh, illustrate this thing here. But then verse 2 says, This woman was with child, she's pregnant, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain, to give birth. You know, Sunday is Mother's Day, and it's interesting that in the Bible, the woman, the mother, the bride, the wife, the, the female, in fact, there's two females that we see uh, juxtaposed in the New Testament. There's the, this woman, and then there's Babylon the harlot, okay? This, th these are metaphors, uh, for either being united with God and bearing His seed, which is His Word, or being united with the devil and receiving His Word and His spirits and His stuff, and then that leads to bringing forth the Antichrist. You know, this is the metaphor here that, that we talk about all the time. But let's look at this business about pregnancy here. We may talk about this again on, on Sunday, but with regard to the devil and with regard to what we as the remnant are, are facing, it's, it's tough. It's, it's, not, an, it's not, an easy, not an easy thing. Keep the place here. In fact, keep the place in Revelation all through tonight. And let's go to Matthew chapter 
7. Matthew 7, verse 13 says it best about when I say that this being who God wants us to be is tough. It's not easy. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it, right? If it was easy, then everybody would be saved. Everybody would walk with Jesus and everybody would be healed and the devil wouldn't have any power in this world at all if the things of God were easy. And they're not, and that's why the world's like it is. Okay? But here's what it says. In Matthew 7, verse 13, it says, Enter through the narrow gate. Well, this word narrow is the same word. It's thalipsis. It's the same word from which we get the word tribulation or trial or trouble. Okay? That's a metaphor. It, it's used other places. I don't have the scripture at hand for you. But there's a time uh, in the end times that, that it's referred to as Jacob's trouble. And that is the metaphor for the woman being pregnant and crying out in the anguish of her delivery, what we just read over there in Revelation 12. And so he says, enter in through that gate. It's like, you, you, you don't escape that, that uh, passage there. You got to travel, you got to travel down that road to get to the destination. Enter through the narrow, the trouble gate. For wide is the gate and broad and easy to travel is the path that leads the way to destruction and eternal loss. And there are many who enter through it but small, narrow, tight, compressed by pressure is the gate, and narrow and difficult to travel is the path that leads the way to life. And there are few that find it. Now, some theologians have used this to say, well, there's not very many people that are saved and go to heaven. Well, we know that's not true. Because in Revelation chapter 7 it talks about there's a vast host that's a big number, so many you can't even count that are in heaven saying our salvation belongs to Jesus. So when it says few find the path to life, we're not talking about few get saved and go to heaven. We're talking about few survive in this time of trouble. And God has called us to be survivors. Okay? But if you want to be a survivor, there is a price to pay. This is what it's saying. Just like if you're going to have a, a child and you're, you're the, the woman and you're pregnant, you have to give birth to the child. Okay, so this is, this is what we signed on for by accepting the word. Now, not every Christian has accepted this word. I mean, most Christians say, well, if you're born again, then the trumpet's going to blow and God's going to take you out of here before any of that time of trouble. Well, we know better than that. So, but if God is going to take us out, or if He's even just going to keep us safe through that time, there is a price to pay. And this is what we're talking about, about being the remnant. Okay, keep the place here in Matthew. Go to Acts chapter 14. Verse 21. Acts 14, verse 21. And I should point out that the context of this is they just stoned Paul and left him for dead and he gets up and he goes back into town because the disciples all stood around him and prayed and maybe raised him from the dead. Anyway... Verse 21, and so he went on in with Barnabas into Derbe and preached there the good news to that city and made many disciples 
and they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening and establishing the hearts of the disciples, encouraging them to remain firm in the faith, saying, It is through many tribulations and hardships that we must enter the kingdom of God. Now, again, entering the kingdom of God, a lot of theologians think that is synonymous with getting saved and going to heaven when you die, and that is not right. That, that's not what entering the kingdom of God means. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, is within you. You know, he said, I cast out demons uh, with the finger of God, then the kingdom of God is being manifested by that. So have you ever cast a demon out of anybody? Well, that's the kingdom of God. He's saying that for God's power to work in you, there is a price to pay. It's not an easy thing. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it, and they're not. Okay? So we should accept this and not withdraw from it, not try to avoid the difficulties that go with being committed to, to God. It goes with the territory. Go back, keep the place in Matthew. We got two places to keep tonight. Well, three actually. Romans, Revelation, and Matthew. But let's go back to Revelation first. Revelation 12, where we were. And I just read verse 2 where it says that the woman, the church, was with child, was pregnant, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain, to give birth. And I just, we just went through that to show what that being in pain to give birth means. Okay. Verse 3, Then another sign was seen in heaven. And again, this is a celestial astronomical event that represents something. Behold, a great fiery red dragon with seven heads and ten horns on his heads and seven royal crowns. Now, I'll let Steve uh, analyze, if he wants to, how that might be playing out in our world. But this much I can tell you, just from looking up these words in Strong's Concordance. A head means the chief, or it means the one to whom others subordinate. Now it says there's seven of them. I think this is interesting that um, Francis Schaeffer and Lauren Cunningham and Bill Bright, uh, Christian leaders from the early, the middle part of the 20th century, came up with this thing about the seven mountains of culture. That you know there's government and there's education and there's media and there's the arts and there's banking and there's the family and so forth. Well, maybe that's the seven mountains, I don't know. Or maybe it's there's actually seven leaders in the world. There's, there's Z in China, or there's Putin in Russia, or this one and that one. Maybe it's that. But the point is, people in the world are subordinate to these seven leaders, or these seven entities, if you will. And if you're subordinate to it, then that means you obey it. You are in lockstep to it. Just like they were in lockstep to Hitler or they were in lockstep to Stalin. And it disturbs me greatly how much America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, has gotten in lockstep with wearing masks and with, with going along with just something that the government and the TV put out. And, oh, everybody, you, you know, you just got, got to go with the program here. Well, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying whether the issue of, that they're saying you should go along with is, is good or bad or right or wrong. The point is, is there, it's a mandate. They're, they're saying you must do this. You must, you must go with the herd. And see, that's, that's being subordinate to something. You know, that the founding fathers of, of America said, we have no king but Jesus. 
And they weren't going to do what King George told them to do. But Americans now will do what King uh, Joe or even King Donald or King uh, George W. or King Barrick, whoever it is. I mean, people will just, hey, I'm supposed to do this because that's what they said. No, you're not supposed to do it because that's what they said. You're supposed to do it because that's what God said. And if there's a difference between the two, you've got to obey God and not man. I think we know this. Okay, a horn, okay, there's seven heads, but ten horns, and a horn is a symbol of power. I can't say I really know what that means, but I notice in Daniel that three of something gets plucked up by the Antichrist, and so then it, it's seven, seven, and seven at some point, so whatever that means. And a crown, according to Strong's Concordance, is the badge of a ruler or the symbol of their authority. You know, we could say that the, we don't, uh, the leaders of America don't wear a crown, but they, ha you know, the president has the great seal, uh, you know, in, when they do the press conferences in the in the, Oval, in, the, in the West Wing or wherever it is they do that. They have the great seal behind it. Well, that is, that is a crown. That is a symbol of their authority. And verse 4 says, And his tail swept across the sky, dragged down a third of the stars of heaven, and flung them to the earth. And the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth. This is us now. The dragon stood in front of, is standing in front of us so that when we give birth, she, uh, he will devour what we are coming into being to be. Well, let's discuss this a little bit. Keep the place here in Revelation and go back to Matthew chapter 21. It would be tempting for me to just um, weasel out of some of these things I'm saying by saying, well, this is my interpretation, or this is my opinion, or, well, take this with a grain of salt, or thus saith the ray. That's one I like to use. Okay, but this is not thus saith the ray. The, 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 Jesus himself has explained some of these things. Okay, first of all, in Matthew chapter 21, verse 23. He entered the temple area, Jesus did, and the chief priests and elders of the people came to him as he was teaching. And they said, well, by what kind of authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to exercise this power? We just got through reading over there in Revelation 12 about seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns. Okay, that's power. That's power being exercised in this world over populations, right? Right? That's what, that's what Revelation was talking about. So now we see Jesus has, who operates with power. He heals people. He casts out demons. He works miracles. And the religious leaders, the religious leaders now, not the political leaders, I find it interesting there is nowhere in the Scripture where Jesus specifically called out Rome. Yeah, he made mention of, well, give to Caesar what Caesar's, and he talked about the rulers of the Gentiles do this, but he did, not one place did he tell them, said, you know, these Romans, they're abusing you, and you shouldn't take that, and you should rise up. And He, he didn't address the, their political situation at all, other than as it pertained to the way the religious leaders were in lockstep or, or cooperating with 
the political leaders, the Roman leaders. He called them out uh, repeatedly. He, he addressed what was wrong inside Israel. He didn't address what was wrong inside Rome. I guess we let Paul do all of that, you know. But, but anyway, let's keep reading. So they, they challenged his authority. They were saying, hey, you know, who you, you're, you're some kind of a rebel. You're a, you're a revolutionary. You're a dissident. You know, you're, you're a troublemaker. You know, you, you don't have the authority to go around, you know, doing these miracle works and, and telling people that you are the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to God but by you. I mean, like that, you know, you have not been authorized to say these things by the powers that be. Right? But Jesus replied to them, well, I will ask you a question. And if you tell me the answer, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Now, this is interesting because they didn't answer his question. So they, therefore, did not know by what authority he was doing these things. And it showed that they did not recognize the difference between God's authority and man's authority. And this is a problem for the church of Jesus Christ when they do not, when, when man's authority and God's authority get kind of intermingled, where you can't tell the difference, then there's confusion. Then you don't know whether something's of God or it isn't. Here's what he said. He asked them a question. He said, the baptism of John, where did it come from? Was it ordained by God or was it from men? And they began debating among themselves, considering the implications of their answer. And they said, well, if we say from heaven, then he will say to us, well, then why did you not believe, John? But if we say from men, we are afraid of the response of the crowd. For they all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, said, well, we do not know. And he said to them, well, neither will I tell you by, why kind of, by what kind of authority I do these things. See, the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees had a problem. <clears throat> and their, their problem, you know, in, in our day we say, well, they were, they were legalists. You know, they were trying to be righteous in, in their own self, in their own works. Well, that was, that was a symptom of their problem. But that wasn't the whole of their problem. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. He says, For I say to you that unless you're... He's talking to a crowd now. He says, I say to you that unless your righteousness, your uprightness, and your moral excellence is more than that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he goes through various... Uh, of the, the commandments in the law, and he shows how the scribes and the Pharisees have tried to kind of water it down and make it easier. Like, you know, well, you will not murder. But he says, well, wait a minute now. If you just hate your brother in your heart, you're still, you're violating that commandment. And, you know, you shall not commit adultery. But if you're lusting after this person that, that you're not married to, then, then that's, that's, you're violating the commandment there, and, and so on it goes. What they were doing, it's not just that they were being sticklers or that they were being meticulous or you know, nitpickers with the word. What they were doing, they were excusing themselves, and they were trying to make it seem like, okay, you know, if there's other places where Jesus gave the parable about the, the unjust steward, and he said, well, they owed the master all of this amount of money, and so the unjust steward went to him and said, oh, no, just cut that in half. You don't owe all of that. You only owe this much. That's what they were doing. See, they, they, were, they were watering down what righteousness really is, what it really means. They were saying, hey, nobody's perfect, so, so just do this much here. That's good enough for God. And Jesus is saying, no, 
that's not good enough for God. Now, what, what isn't being discussed here is that Jesus is going to go pay the price, you know, three and a half years later for all the stuff that anybody ever did that's not good enough for God, which is ever one of us and in all of our lives, basically. But the point is, they, they were saying, hey, just be a good person, you know, and don't make waves, you know, pay your taxes and, and you know, do all the stuff that, that everybody does and you'll be okay. Now, see, that, that message is out there in Christendom also. This is my point. And it's, it's just as wrong for us now as it was for them then. Go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. Because when we really do make a commitment to have the kind of righteousness and to live with that moral purity and excellence that Jesus talks about, then what happens here in Romans 10, I mean in Matthew 10, 22, is what you're going to get. It says, you will be hated by everyone because of your association with my name. But the one who has patiently persevered and endured to the end, will be saved. I'm pointing all of this out because back in Revelation chapter 12, when it says that the dragon has stationed himself in front of the woman to devour the man-child, right before that it talks about the world system. Right? The seven heads, the ten horns, and the seven crowns. And then it says that then the devil is stationed in front of the church. What, what are we being told here? We're being told that the devil is using... The devil has taken over the world system to such a degree that he is using the world's system to try to prevent the man-child from coming forth. Now that's us, folks. The devil is trying to use what's going on in this world right now to keep us from coming to that maturity that Jesus Christ has called us to. I mean, this is as current as today's news right here. All right? Verse 5. This is the one we like. It says, And she, the woman, brings forth a man-child who is destined to rule and shepherd all the nations with the rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Well, let's talk about that. In Revelation chapter 14, it takes this description of the man-child and elaborates on it just a little bit. <clears throat> Over in verse 12, it doesn't really tell you very much other than just the child is caught up to God and to his throne. Now, Steve Jordan is, is taught, as God has revealed to him, that this is not the last we're going to hear about the man-child. The man-child is going to come back, and the man-child is going to, to feed the rest of the church in the strength of the Lord, from Micah chapter 5. But over here in Revelation chapter 14... Here's what it says about the man-child. Okay, it says, He looked and saw the Lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name inscribed on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of great waters, like the rumbling of mighty thunder, and the voice I heard seemed like the music that was the sound of harpists playing their harps. Then verse 4, and these are the ones who've not been defiled by relations with women, with the world's systems. For they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They have been purchased and redeemed from among men as the first fruits. No lie was found in their mouth, for they are blameless. 
Now, we have, <coughs> I have, and I'm sure you have too, thought about this number, 144,000, and when we set that next to the total population of the Earth right now, like seven or eight billion, and even if, okay, they say that about a third of the world's population claims to be the quote-unquote Christian world. Okay, so two and a half billion maybe would be in what would be considered the Christian nations. Now, obviously, not all those people are born again Christians, but even if a, a, a fraction of that are born again Christians, 144,000 is still a small number, right? I mean, a very small percentage of the total population of born again Christians on planet Earth right now. So, what, what are we looking at here? Well, there's a precedent for this. Go back to Romans chapter 11. Verse 2. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Now, of course, here it's talking about Israel, but if, if Israel was God's people then, certainly the body of Christ is God's people now, right? We're God's people. Christians are God's people. Okay, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleaded with God against Israel and said, Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. But what is God's response to him? God said, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Now, we could get into all of the math of this, but the point is, it was a very small percentage of the population of Israel at that time. I can give you another example. You can let the place in Romans go. Go to 1 Chronicles chapter 12. God doesn't need a large body of people to do an important work. Just like I don't need some really highfalutin fancy thing to protect my pipes when it gets really cold. This old sock will do just fine. You know, and if, if I don't think so, I'll get another one and, and put a rubber band around them. You know, so the whole surface is covered. It doesn't have to be something big and fancy. All right, First Chronicles chapter 12, it goes through... The, um, the list of, of who all gathered uh, in David's army to support him when he was going to be made king. And it, it lists, you know, all of these different tribes, the tribe of Simeon, and, and there were 4,000 of them, and the tribe of Judah, there were 6,800 of them, and so on and so forth. But you come down here to verse 32, of the tribe of Issachar, there was only 200 of them. But there's a couple of things in there that says about the tribe of Issachar that I think are, are critical for us. Number one, it says, they understood the times with a knowledge of what Israel should do. Now, it has always been part of Romans 8's teaching to understand end-time prophecy. I mean, from back before I was coming here, Owen was teaching end-time prophecy. When I, when I started coming in 1978, he was teaching the Day of the Lord series for probably the third time. And he, he probably taught it three or four more times after that. And then, then after that, Steve Jordan started teaching it. And he's been teaching it ever since 2006 or some such. Okay? And we stay on top of things, and I know you all do too. 
that, that for what, whoever you consider to be a credible source of information, and I'm not going to say, well, you ought to listen to this when you're not all listen. I'll let the Holy Spirit tell you who to listen to and who not to listen to. I will say, if all you listen to is ABC, NBC, and, and Fox, you're not getting all the information you need. But that said, um, we have tried to stay on top of what's happening because we know we're in the end times and we know everything that's happening plays into that. So I th I'd say we are at least trying to be sons of Issachar that know the times and know what we should do. And also it said that their relatives were at their command. Now, I don't mean that we go to our kids and our nephews and our cousins and our, oh, you need to do this and you need to do that, that we order them around. No, but they're watching us. You know, the, the, the life that we have lived in front of them, the word that we have spoken, it's out there and it has sticking power. And, that, and God is going to take that. You know, we don't have to enforce it for them. God enforces it to them. God, God lets them see and he lets them remember uh, what we are about. Okay, but there was only 200 of them. There were 7,000 who didn't bow their knee to Baal. So if there's only 144,000 man-child that is the remnant in this time, well, okay. Um... Go to Isaiah chapter 37. The remnant has a very specific role in the spiritual warfare that goes on. And it's not all... Uh, visible to the public, I'll say. Isaiah 37, verse 21. We've gone through this whole thing about how the Rabshakeh came to Israel and he threatened them that the king of Assyria was going to conquer them and so forth. And so Hezekiah the king, he prayed to God and God said, no, king of Assyria is not going to conquer you. And then he sent Isaiah to to encourage uh, Hezekiah in verse 21. It says, Then Isaiah son of Amos sent word to Hezekiah saying, The Lord, the God of Israel says this, Because you have prayed to me about Sennacherib the king of Assyria, who would be a, a metaphor for Satan, right? This is the word that the Lord has spoken against him. She has shown contempt for you and mocked you. She being the daughter of Zion, the virgin daughter of Zion. Now this is an interesting thing because see, it, it conflates the, the female gender with the, the man-child in Revelation 14 who is a virgin, right? So it's saying that the man-child is coming out of the woman. Right? Coming out of the church. Right now, we're still the woman. We're not the man-child yet. He, Christ is being formed within us. I'll talk about this more on Sunday. You know, it is interesting, just, just, just as an aside, that the Supreme Court has now announced that they are going to overturn Roe versus Wade. Now, that doesn't mean that's going to end all abortions in America. It just means that it's going to let the states decide, which is the way it should have been in the first place, in my opinion. You know, that whenever anything gets centralized, there's a problem. There's always a problem with collecting everything all in one pile and making that whole pile go with, with one thing. It's like, okay, you know, we're going to have, we're gonna have uh, sugar cookies and we're going to have Sprite. And that's it. You can't have anything else but sugar, cookies, and Sprite in here. And you, know, you might say, well, but I want, I want uh, club crackers and I want Dr. Pepper. Well, you can't have that. You, know, you can only have this right here. See, that's dictatorship. That's tyranny. And that's what, that's what they have been 
gradually imposing, I'm getting political here, I know, but that's what they've been gradually imposing on America for the last 50 years, is tyranny. And so now we look at, well, how did we get here? Well, little by little, they have centralized everything. And that was not the way this place was set up to run. Okay? So, anyway. The virgin daughter of Zion has shaken her head behind you. The daughter of Jerusalem. Whom have you taunted and blasphemed? And against whom have you raised your voice? He's talking uh, metaphorically to Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. He said, you have raised your voice against the Holy One of God. Verse 30. This shall be a sign to you, Hezekiah. You are to eat this year of what grows of itself, and in the second year that which springs from the same, and in the third year you are to sow and harvest and plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Now, this does refer by analogy to what Israel was commanded to do every seven years. They were supposed to let the land lie fallow, and they were, they were supposed to store up stuff so they wouldn't r reap the crops every single year. And they didn't obey that, by the way. So the 70 years that they were in captivity in, the Babel, in Babylon was how many of those seven-year things that they should have observed that they didn't. But there's another point here pertaining to us, pertaining to the woman, pertaining to the wilderness. Keep the place here. Go back to Revelation chapter 12. And that is... When the crisis time comes, God was, when the crisis time came to Israel back there under Hezekiah, God had Isaiah encourage Hezekiah, hey, God is going to see that you get fed. Even though you are under attack from this foreign power, you're still going to be fed. Right? In Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, I know you know this is where we're going, but it says, the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that she should be nourished there for 1,260 days, for three and one half years. Just like over there with Hezekiah, Isaiah was telling him, hey, you're gonna, you're gonna, for the next three years, you're going to be able to eat. So, if we have to get out of society as we know it, God still says He's going to feed us. And, and, yet, and it's prophesied right there in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. Okay? Back to Isaiah um, chapter 37. You can let the place in Revelation go now. Isaiah 37, verse 31. The surviving remnant of the house of Judah will again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem will come a remnant, and from Mount Zion a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Now, that last phrase there, tells us how it's going to happen. That God has already said in His Word He's going to do this. So we should just give Him the faith. But in verse 31, He does assign us some things, okay? He does say there is a process that you will participate in if you're going to be the remnant. And it describes it this way. It says... You will take root downward and bear fruit upward. Well, in the New Testament, uh, taking root and bearing fruit are, are discussed. And they have meaning besides just the, the, the picture of planting something in your garden. Okay, Go to Ephesians chapter 3. 
Let's talk first of all about taking root. Ephesians 3. You know that song by Dean and Mary, Rooted and Grounded, okay? That is talking about what we're talking about here. Um, in Ephesians chapter 3, um, verse 16, says, May God grant you out of the riches of His glory. See, it's something He's going to do. We don't have to come up with it. He's going to do it, but we need to be receptive to it. May He grant you out of the riches of His glory to be strengthened and spiritually energized with power through His Spirit in your inner self. See, this is an inward thing. It's a thing of the heart. That was the thing the Pharisees and scribes were missing. That it's not just outward behavior. It's in your heart so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through your faith. And may you, having been rooted and securely grounded in love, be fully capable of comprehending with the saints. Now, that has to do with our understanding. You know, it's, when we talk about our hearts, let's not assume that that, that, mean, that, that leaves your head out. It's your, your whole inner self is not just your emotions, your feelings, and your sense of well-being. It's also your understanding. And he's saying that when you are rooted and grounded, you will understand the things of God. With all the saints, what is the width and length and height and depth of His love? You know, I was measuring some things today, and... You know, you've got to measure all of those dimensions. You can't just, well, it's, it's, as long as it's this long, then you got it. Well, maybe not, you know. You, it, that's fine, it's this long, but you also have to have some depth to know how, how, where you're going to put that thing and how far it sits up off the floor. See, that God has plans for us that are very specific, but if we're just kind of willy-nilly about it, we might, it, what He wants for us might not be a good fit in our lives. That's why sometimes it seems like the things of God just kind of, they don't make sense. Okay. So that you may come, well, to be fully capable of comprehending the depth, width, length, height, and, uh, and the, the width, length, height, and depth of His love, and that you may come to know practically through personal experience the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience, that you may be filled throughout your being to all the fullness of God, that you may have the richest experience of God's presence in your life, completely filled and flooded with God Himself. Now that's being the man, the man child. That, that's, the, that's the destination we're coming to. And in Colossians chapter 2, it speaks of that. Colossians 2 verse 5. Well, let's start at verse 6. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, walk in union with Him, having been deeply rooted in Him, and now being continually being built up in Him, becoming increasingly more established in your faith, just as you were taught, and overflowing in it with gratitude. Frequently the Christian life is referred to as a journey. And this describes the, the ongoingness of it, the, the, the continual uh, aspect of being rooted and grounded. 
So just the idea of planting a seed in the ground and then walking away. Well, even there, you know, um, we planted a garden a week ago, was it? Yeah. And praise God, we got some nice rain to water in that stuff. But I'll tell you, probably in a week or so, it's going to be very hot and it's not going to be raining. What does that mean? That means we're going to have to water. Right? So if, a, if the seed of the word is planted in our life, okay, we got born again. We got filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, we had an experience with God back whenever. Okay, then, then that's it. You just slide your way to heaven on the seat of your pants, right? No, it's a walk. It's a process. All right? And in Matthew chapter 13, when Jesus does the parable of the seeds, he shows how... It's not just a matter of just throwing the seed out there and it's going to do what it's going to do. It will do what it's supposed to do given the right set of circumstances. But, um, for example, um, in Matthew 13, verse 19, it says... When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand and grasp it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. And this is the one of the seed that is sown beside the road. So there again, it tells you that we should understand and that's why he gave us the Holy Spirit, so we would understand. It's not just up to your education or your intellect or your genetics or whatever. The Holy Spirit gives us understanding. Then it goes on. The, one, the seed that fell on rocky ground, this is one who hears the word and at once welcomes it with joy. Well, it sounds like that's what you're supposed to do. But he has no root in himself. Well, that, that suggests that there's something we're supposed to do with that seed. We're, we're supposed to cultivate it, water it. Well, how do you water the seed? Well, you water the seed by reading the Word, by praying in the Spirit, by coming to church and fellowshipping with other believers, by, by living the life. He has no root in himself, but is only temporary. And when pressure or persecution comes... Where did we start today? Talking about the woman being pregnant? Well, that is going to come. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. See, this, this is part and parcel about being the remnant. Is you have to put up with the, with the garbage. You have to put up with the attack. You have to fight back. You, you have to stand your ground. You, you, you have to, to not uh, hide. You have to not run. You have to not freak out. You, you, you have to, to be there. You know, you, you have to swing your sword. You have to quote the word. You, you have to take yourself by the nap of the neck and say, no, self, you're not going to do what your flesh wants to do. You're, gonna, you're not going to say what... You know, that, that response that you'd like to say if, if it's wrong. This is stuff that we got to do. See, if you don't do it, then when, when, not if, but when the pressure or persecution comes because of the Word. It's because of the Word. It's not because you're such a lousy person. It's because the Word's in you. If the Word weren't in you, a lot of stuff wouldn't be happening, except the stuff that happens to everybody, Right? But because of the word. But immediately he stumbles and falls away because he had no root. And the one to whom was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the worries, the distractions of the world, the deceitfulness and pleasure and delight of riches choke the word and it yields no fruit. But the one on whom the seed was sown on good soil this is the one who hears the word, understands and grasps it, and he indeed bears fruit. Some a hundred times, some sixty times, and some thirty. 
well, okay, what is fruit? There's actually several ways in which in the New Testament uses that term to describe the result of living the Christian life. But one thing is real, real clear. Galatians chapter 5. And this should take some of the pressure off of us. Because some, some out there will say, bearing fruit means how many people you've led to Jesus. No, that's not your fruit. That's not something that, that you can claim as, as yours. That would be the fruit of the gospel. I mean, that would be the fruit of Jesus. And okay, and if you're doing that, you're preaching Jesus and people get saved, well, hallelujah. I mean, you know, it says you can, you can rejoice in that, but that's not your fruit. That's not the fruit that grows when you are rooted and grounded. In fact, look, there are people out there preaching the gospel that are shysters and people still get saved in their ministry. Well, how can this be? Because it's the gospel that saves them, not that preacher. Okay? So, it's not that, that's not it. You know, people getting saved is not the fruit. It's not the spiritual fruit that grows when you're, when you're rooted and grounded in Jesus. Here it says that the fruit is what the Holy Spirit produces in your life. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. says, The fruit of the Holy Spirit, the result of His presence within us, is love, which is unselfish concern for others. I think that is probably the best definition of agape love that the Bible can give. Joy inner peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. See, in myself, I don't have much of any of that, really. <laughs> I really don't. But the Holy Spirit gives us that as we remain rooted and grounded in Him. And it says, and against such things there is no law. And furthermore, I'll leave you with this. You're going to let the place in Matthew go, go, but go to the Gospel of John. Verse 15. No, excuse me, verse 1. Chapter 15, verse 1. There's so many metaphors in the Bible, it's easy to kind of get them all mixed up, but with regard to bearing fruit, here's what Jesus has to say about how that happens in us. He says, I am the vine and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. That will happen in this time that we're entering into now. That, that Christians who are not rooted and grounded in Him, for the most part, I believe, are going to die in the tribulation. That's why there's a vast host that no one can count. You know, I don't think that, that Christians who are just nominal Christians or Christians who are you know, carnal, they're saved, but they're not walking with Jesus. I don't see how they're going to survive in the days that lie ahead because you won't be able to buy or sell if you don't take the mark of the beast. And if you take the mark of the beast, it says you're going to be damned for eternity. So I don't see how a Christian can survive unless they go to the wilderness with the woman. And see, that's a commitment. But anyway, he says, uh, if you don't bear fruit, you're taken away. And every branch that continues to bear fruit, God repeatedly prunes. Now this is an interesting thing. God himself doesn't test anybody. It says that in James. 
but it says that we are tested and tried when our own flesh, our own lust and desires put us in a situation where, ouch, that hurt. God didn't do that, but He uses that situation to set us free from whatever that thing was that made that ouchy thing there. Okay? He repeatedly prunes so that we will bear more fruit, even richer and finer fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have given you. Remain in me. Man, that is it. You know, I have a, a hat that I wear when I go run. It says, don't quit. Left, right, repeat. Remain in me. Don't run off. He said, and I will remain in you. Just as no branch can bear fruit by itself without remaining in the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. For otherwise apart from me, that is cut off from vital union with me, you can do nothing. That's, that's the Christian life in a nutshell right there. And he's the one that makes the fruit happen. We just have to stay connected to him. And, you know, I didn't say a whole lot about Satan in the message tonight other than to say that Satan is, is testing us. He, he's, he's creating these situations and a lot of it is in the world. And a lot of it, if we're not attuned to the Holy Spirit, I, the, the world out there, they, they don't know what's going on. They're, they're clueless. What, Ellen, what was that you went into the store? What, tell, tell us about that. What was that that you went to the store and that girl didn't, didn't know beans about what you were... You were talking about the, 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 the container ships in China or something. What was yeah, that? Um, it was a store and they did not have the supplies for the customers. And um, very clueless. I, 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 we, we visited a little bit and I, I made the comment that, well, um, you know, because it was said, well, none of our other stores had these supplies either. It's a, it was a chain mm -hmm. uh, store, and they needed paper, a particular kind of paper, like photo paper. Right. And none of them had the supplies, and, and I said, well, you know, one of the reasons is because um, you probably don't have it in the warehouse because she said, well, we've had it on order for, you know, weeks and weeks. <laughs> and I said, well, okay, I guess that just means that in, in your distribution warehouse, they don't have it there either because nobody seems to have it. And she said, she was just like, yeah, yeah. And, and I said, well, you know, it, I, they're probably sitting on a container ship out there in the middle of the ocean because they won't let them unload at the docks. And she just looked at me like the deer in the headlights. Just, uh, she had no clue what I was talking about. Because, <laughs> yes, I know. And she, you know, she wasn't the manager. She just was a worker there. But it just shows no one's paying any attention to what's going on. Except the remnant. Oh. <laughs> You're part of the remnant. Amen. So, Father, thank you for making us part of your remnant. And thank you for, for you causing the, the seed of your word to grow in us. And thank you for your grace that, that enables us to stay the course and finish the race. And thank you for, for the plan that you have set forth in your word, the promises and the prophecies and the understanding that you give us from your word, by your spirit. And Father, we just, we depend on that and we look to you to get us through and, and we look to you to supply our needs. And Father, I thank you that in your word, 
you said you're not willing to do without a cheerful giver, but that you would make all grace and favor and earthly blessing to come to them in abundance. 